Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Good day, everyone. How are you going? Thanks for joining us on the Smart Property Investment Show. Wherever you're listening to this right now, no doubt you're locked down somewhere. Australia's mixed fortunes when it comes to its journey through COVID-19, while the rest of Australia seems to be moving into some new sense of normal. Our friends and colleagues down in Victoria are still right down the middle of lockdown, some significant lockdowns. And the Premier is copping a, an absolute sledging at the moment about how he's acting. Uh, people are calling him a megalomaniac. Uh, whether he's doing the right thing or not, who knows? Uh, we've obviously got people from right across the world tuning into this, uh, Australian property investors who uh, may be expats in the UK or in uh, over in the US uh, who are also in lockdown. So our thoughts are out there. We're all still connected. Uh, Australian property moves on irrespective of what's going on in the marketplace. And I'm very fortunate that I get to chat to investors and uh, professionals right across the nation, also globally around the Australian property market. You speak to some of them, they're going to tell you it's going to go backwards 40%. We won't talk about that person today. Whereas a lot of the commentators that I get the privilege of talking to have a more measured approach to property investment in Australia. And if you go back 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, property has always been a very good asset class, hence the reason why I invest in property. But I want to get stuck into some of the markets today and a bit of a step outside the normal. I've got quite a few people on the podcast, so it's going to be a bit of a learning curve for me to see whether or not I can manage uh, three other voices, which are probably larger than mine. I've got the guys from Open Corp in our virtual studio, and they are Cameron McLennan, Matthew Lewison, and Michael Beresford. They're all directors of uh, Open Corp. They all do different things and we'll work out what they are. Gentlemen, how are you going? You well? Yeah, very well, Phil. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Hey, just uh, before we get going, how do you guys all know each other? You're working together. You're all directors of Open Corp. There's got to be some backstory somewhere, Cam. Yeah, cool, mate. I, uh, yeah, so I moved down from the country in my early 20s and was working as a box boy at uh, Safeway in one of the outer eastern suburbs of Melbourne. Another guy working there was Al Lewison, who's one of who's Matt's brother. Al and I became good mates, actually married sisters. Not our own sisters, mate, that'd be weird, but we, uh, we each married one of them. And uh, so we're brother-in-laws, kids are cousins, obviously. We're business partners, been investing in, in business for well, well over 20, 20 years now. I was probably very lucky that I knew I just wanted to invest in property and Al's dad was a successful investor and property developer and Grabbed Al and I and Matt at the time by the scrap of the neck when we were young kids and shoved us into property investing. And Steve's been my mentor, one of my mentors up until today. So I still bounce ideas. He's on the board of a number of our companies. Matt do you want to, and Boz, do you want to give a bit of a snapshot on how you guys came into the play? Yeah, I'll uh, take the reins on this one. So um, when I was a teenager, I was playing footy and happened to play footy with Michael. And he was running around. I think he was the fittest bloke at the, uh, the, the club. It was only a suburban footy club. He was the fittest guy there in pre-season. He'd be running laps, lapping everybody else. And when he finished, he'd go to the back of the line and just encourage everybody else through. Lost contact, didn't see him for 10 years while I was up in Queensland working in the property industry and bumped into Michael at a function. Found out he worked in the industry. And when Cam, Al and I were sort of brainstorming open court, I said, you know what? I know the perfect guy who can help mentor people if this guy's like treats property investment the way that he used to encourage people on the footy field he would be an absolute gun and we called him up out of the blue and i guess that was pretty much it i think we had one chat and it just all gelled and said yeah let's do it and we haven't looked back since it's all right and you still look like you're in pretty reasonable nick there michael you're still out there running around <laughs> you, you got to do something in stage four lockdown Phil, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah go a bit stir crazy with uh without some health and fitness so yeah good way to uh Keep your mind sharp in uh, in times like this. It is. And uh, speaking of minds being sharp or, or how you guys, so you're all Melbourne-based and you're all locked down at the moment. Uh, has it been a good journey for yourselves individually and collectively? No doubt it's given you an opportunity to really think critically about not only property markets and how you go about sort of servicing investors and, and other people who are looking to create wealth through property. You probably sort of had about a million new business ideas in, in the process. <laughs> We have about a million new business ideas. We're pretty, uh, we're, we're recently set in our way. We like to challenge what we do consistently. But um, I mean, we set up about a year or so ago, 18 months ago on Microsoft SharePoint and our investment consulting team. We've got half our clients in Sydney and spread across Australia. We've got Perth and Brisbane offices as well. But being in lockdown, mate, it hasn't been a huge change. I probably, I'm sure we all miss going to the office and, you know, the culture we had there was, it's pretty dynamic and, you know, 40 odd property enthusiasts all thrown into an office under one roof. It's good times, sort of heaven as a property investor myself being in there. But 
yeah, it's been good business as normal, even the lockdown. I'm trying to break it up, not stare at a screen and get the kids out of the house every couple of hours besides that, mate. So, yeah, we tick along. We've got a saying in our business used for the last few years of don't go chasing red balloons. There's always new things coming up and something shiny and that can, I guess, distract you from what you're really trying to achieve. And I guess these times is probably one of those risky points where a lot of people start chasing red balloons and we just double down on what we're doing, refocus, make sure that we do it better, that we refine things and, yeah, I guess, learn from anything that we can so that tomorrow will be even better than we were yesterday. And I think that's a really good point in terms of how the best property investors operate in these type of markets. Yes, COVID has disrupted property markets right across the nation, but the best investors I'm seeing, and to your point around not chasing red balloons, that the strategy is largely consistent with best property investors. They haven't deviated too from it. Just the tactics to achieve those strategies may have changed under a COVID environment. Maybe, Cam, that's something you can speak to, You know, your general view towards or attitude towards the property market at the moment with I guess, the mindset of an investor and what you shouldn't be doing. Yeah, that's fine. I'm, I might give a bit of um, preamble to that, mate, and then um, handball to one of the boys. So I think um, one thing we've got, which I was speaking to you about earlier, we've got a new book that I'm releasing, Investing in the New Normal, which is it's actually a white paper that uh, we were handed from uh, Matt Nell's dad I don't know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, when he started teaching us about investing and really... It was scraps of paper that was drawn out about what you should and shouldn't do during di- different economic times. And he'd come through, you know, the 87 recession, the recession that we had to have in the 90s, which is probably because Collingwood won the premiership was the real reason behind the recession. But I mean, since then, we've had financial crisis. We've had terrorism attacks, which knocked out America, which was huge to us. You know, Australia's followed the US into war six of the next year or six years after that, where we had the GFC which is the biggest you know, economic shock to the world. Three of the next 10 years were severely impacted for investors by APRA and the levers they were pulling to slow down the Sydney property market and the Royal Commission. So we've had some huge events ticking along the way. And what we were able to do with this white paper that we've been working on over the last 20 years, that we'd had our hands on it, and Steve had it previous to that, was to shape it into our current investment strategy, which we really put to the test through the GFC. We had five or 600 clients who were investing with us and the strategy we put in place. And we we're glad to say that not one of those clients was impacted throughout the GFC and they came out the back end of it. We're now having that strategy fine tuned and put to the test again. But um, to your point as where we are currently, Matt, uh, Boz, do you want to jump in and uh, give us a snapshot? Boz is waving his hand around there. Yeah, to your point, Phil, there's never going to be a perfect time to invest and part of what we do as an organization, as a smaller client facing team is really just hold people's hand across that journey because it's not always going to be, you know, blue skies and sunshine. There are going to be some bumpy periods along the way in terms of economic shocks and so forth. But we're really big on coming back to what are the fundamentals that drive markets, the front page of the paper, the headline will tell you something different that's there to, to sell papers. We're really about trying to help people understand what are those underlying factors and what are the influences on those uh, short, medium and long term that, that are going to impact the property market. There are always opportunities. You just got to be glass half full. And, you know, as we were coming through COVID, you know, we didn't know exactly what was going to happen in terms of the virus itself. But on a weekly basis, we were, you know, providing some video content and update for clients as to the kind of indicators we look for in an economic downturn, what we expected to happen. You know, 99% of those ended up uh, ended up unfolding in the last kind of four to six months. So I guess when it's like anything, when you've been through it a few times, like Cam said, with those different downturns, you know what the recipe is, you know the playbook and being able to help people focus a little bit more on the facts rather than the hysteria is where it can help. And I think just taking their points as well, Phil, And coming back to something I said earlier about sticking to our knitting, and that's obviously important for all investors. There's so many different types of residential property and different types of property in general that you can invest in. We formed a view a long ago from my dad's advice that we wanted to be in the housing market. There was always seemed to be lots of demand for houses. We like to be in well-located spots where there's good amenity. We like to be where there's families and tends to be open space around. And when you look at, I guess, what's happened with COVID-19, like all around the world, even New York, when New York was in like massive shutdown and they were probably the epicenter of the world for COVID infections, there were real estate agents four hours drive out of New York in upstate New York, I think they call it, 
selling houses that nobody had ever walked through and they'd been on the market for a year and all of a sudden they're just getting snapped up sight unseen. People started to flee some of those urban centres and go towards, I guess, where there was a bit more space. And yeah, we're in stage four lockdown here in Melbourne. We all live in, I guess, the sort of middle ring suburbs. And you walk around the parks and you think, geez, there's no better place in the world. I'd rather be in stage four lockdown than than right here. Actually, I'd much rather not be in stage four lockdown. So there's lots of cities around Australia I'd, I'd happily be in right now. But yeah, I guess the open space is one of those things that we've all appreciated. And you see, again, in the housing markets, we've managed 1,200 properties ourselves. And across that portfolio, we've seen rent reduction overall of less than 1% across our portfolio. So to another uh, agent this afternoon in Brisbane who manages 900 properties in the northern suburbs of Brisbane. They've had about a 5% reduction, but they've also been managing apartments, townhouses, as well as house and land or single family homes, for want of a better term. So I guess at that end of the market, there's been fairly limited impact. And when borrowing rates have dropped by 30% for what the borrower is paying on their interest, most of our clients and ourselves included I've actually seen cash flow improve as a result of COVID and it sort of, I almost feel guilty saying that because I know how bad an impact it's had on so many people's livelihoods around the world. Yeah. And I guess that lends itself to making sure you acquire the right assets at the right time and generating your portfolio. And, and when you hear the horror stories coming out of some property investors in this current market, it's probably because they've invested in in the wrong spots. And I guess the question for you, Michael, would be, you know, working on the front line with investors and shaping their perceptions towards it. One thing you are guaranteed with property is change, change for the better, change for the worse. And a lot of those things you cannot control. And Cam spoke to some of them being, you know, APRA pulling some levers to try and slow down markets, et cetera, et cetera. So what's been your advice and recommendations for property investors to, you know, get stability in their thought process and stay the course through what is a period of disruption? What are they doing? Yeah, I guess the the three main things I'd say, Phil, you know, one is be doing whatever you can at any point in time to improve your situation. You're not always going to be in a position, whether it be borrowing capacity or cash flow or job security, to be adding that next property to your portfolio. But if you're doing what you can when you can, you really create that positive momentum that pays off long term. The second thing I'd say is around buffers. So Cam mentioned how we were able to help shield our clients from you know, no one having to sell a property during the GFC or at a loss. We're not, you know, flying so close to the wind that there aren't buffers in place and that we're stretching our clients' cash flow and affordability. If they can't do it on conservative numbers, they shouldn't be doing it anyway. So when they see the actuals versus what we've budgeted on, obviously the actuals are far more favourable and that gives them a lot of comfort. The third thing is taking a long-term approach and we're really big on trying to help them understand that we don't make long-term decisions based on short-term circumstances. Markets have and will always cycle. And that's where really it comes back to playing the long game. But also the fact that you know our strategy, the scrap paper that Cam talks about back in the day, that hasn't changed in over 20 years. The formula that we apply today is exactly the same formula that we help our clients execute. It's exactly the same formula that we started with decades ago. So We feel we've got the rest to be right. Markets will always come back. You want to be in the market to take advantage of that, but it's really around how you de-risk your situation with buffers and de-risk your investments, you know, so that you're not uh, not exposed to market shocks, whether it be in prices or in rental vacancy. Yeah, and it's a good point. And, you know, I'm always thinking about when I'm investing now is that, you know, always having an eye on the long game, but investing for the now for tomorrow. And you spoke about this strategy hasn't necessarily changed in the last 20 years, Cam, what you guys are executing both personally and for your clients. What is that? You know, what is the baseline philosophy that you gents have towards being good at property investment? Yes, um, it's a ripper question. So I see, and I'm obviously good at business, built a number of businesses over the years, and I see business comes down to having a process and a strategy which gives you a measured outcome. A lot of people invest in property and they don't have a strategy. So everyone, well, everyone of your listeners either works or they're in business themselves. So everyone who even works within a business knows that there's process that goes along. When it came to property investing, I was dumbfounded that people don't apply a strategy to get a very specific outcome that they want. So we started breaking down all the steps along the road to investment. It's not just finding the investment itself. So right back to setting up your team. So your accountant, solicitor, conveyancer, mentor, if you so choose, it's pre-approval, finding the investment itself, settling on it, finding a tenant. There's risk the whole way along the way. 
if you can look at each of those areas and document it and challenge your strategy on each of those areas consistently and improve it, you end up being having a strategy that you can stick by and, like you said, play the long game. When it comes to finding the individual investment, we spend a lot of time, and I felt that most people pick property like they were throwing darts at a dartboard or driving a car blindfold. It's literally the lunacy of the way people pick property the majority of the time. So the way we decided to pick property, if you look at it, well, there's 10 million odd properties out there, it's pretty tough seeing the majority of people buying their local postcode out of the 10 million properties to ensure that you're getting the best property for you at that specific point in time. That's pretty hit and miss. So why we do we strategize it was a process we call MAC. And if you hear this terminology anywhere else, mate, they've stolen it from us. So be clear on that. So the MAP process we developed a long time ago with Steve's help. And the process is basically looking, first of all, at the capital city markets, looking at a number of drivers. And we've got check sheets on our website that people can use if they want to you know, go through the process. But knocking out huge portions of the 10 million options you've got when you want to find that specific property. Then looking at the growth corridors that give you the best population growth and limited supply. So we like infill areas of medium density housing, so areas that have limited supply. And then finally, we get down to the point of the optimum size and quality property for that area. So what we're trying to do at every point in time is minimise the amount of poor options, maximise the amount of growth, and get a good balance of yield and growth. So people promote cash flow versus negative gearing and all those sort of things. We don't subscribe to that. I want high growth property that I'll take advantage of negative gearing for a couple of years, and then a couple of years after that, it's cash flow positive. Or in today's rate, most properties we're providing clients are cash flow positive anyway with the interest rates the way they are. You can see while I've spitballed that into a quick sentence, mate, I think the key message is there's risks along the way, but if you document and follow that risk and then challenge it for that process, you reduce the risk all the way through investors. Yeah, and, and everyone needs to have their own appetite and attitude to risk. And I've seen some extremely risky property investors and I just shake my head sometimes of what they're doing. And a lot of them don't have a strategy. And I think the key thing I take from what you just said there, Cam, is that the best property investors do this naturally organically, but it takes for other property investors some time to understand this is that they need to delineate between objective strategies and tactics. And it sounds as though your particular organization there, you know, at the strategic level, how you support clients, but you break it down on the tactical level. And and Matthew, um, you know, when you get into the identification of a particular place, suburb, whatever it is that supports a strategy, that sort of lends itself to your particular expertise. How are you assessing the market right now, considering COVID-19, but for how the future will look, those sort of macro and microeconomic drivers that will shape marketplaces? There are so many variables which will determine whether or not a place will deliver, to Cameron's point, good capital growth. How do you do that? What's the secret sauce? There's obviously a lot of statistics that you can look at at a suburban level as well. So as Cam said, we look market area, then property. So the area is sort of secondary after we've picked which capital city market we want to be in. And then we're looking at as I said, infrastructure, we're looking at vacancy rates, we're looking at what's going to impact supply of new property coming through the market in the coming years as well, because not just today, we're not looking at a single point in time and saying, well, it's a great investment today and who cares about tomorrow? We care as much about next year and the year after as we do about today. And I think that's, again, where some investors go wrong. They're looking for the quick win, thinking this is the deal of a lifetime. They're not thinking about is this going to keep making money for me for five and 10 years into the future? So obviously looking at some of those demographic things as well, how much demand is there going to be in this area in the future? And then how do we decide what the best property is? And to give a quick example, I had an investment property I built about 10 years ago. And in that local market where I picked up that property, the ideal property at that point in time was a four bed, two car garage with one living area. And For us, the extra expense on putting in a second living area or any extra, I guess, space inside the house wasn't going to pay off in any additional rent at that point in time or in additional value. In fact, we would have been crossing over the threshold for overcapitalizing had we done it. Now, that same suburb five years later had changed and evolved and houses going into, I guess, that suburb today, we're absolutely putting in two living areas and a study and at times even a butler's pantry, knowing that where we're putting those in, we're going to get a premium on it. If you're spending $15,000 on the extra room, you're getting $30,000 worth of value out of it plus extra rent. And we kind of have to do that in any suburb that we're active in. We're saying, what's the preferred product? What's going to get the optimum valuation compared to the cost that we're putting in? And what's going to get the best rent? And you can see there's really subtle things in each suburb that 
get a premium in that local market. And it can be floor coverings or it can be furnishings or the size of the house or the landscaping even. One thing I think people miss when it comes to investing, a lot of people talk about you know, bookending property with a yield and a growth property or they look at the individual property as the be all and end all. What I think most people, why they don't build reasonable size portfolios to get to where they want is they're not getting a good balance of yield and growth. So making sure you have a property that gives good growth, that has got a low cost to hold. So it's all about duplication, setting yourself up to buy the next one. So having your finance structure right and having the type of property right. So I think that duplication allows you to play the long game, which is something we just you know, sing from the rooftops. Absolutely. And Michael, sort of on the front line, sort of investor services, understanding you know, and, and guiding clients through their investor journey. Uh, the people who are coming to you guys now, do you feel more educated than what they would have been sort of five, 10 years ago? There's so much information in the marketplace. So people probably come with a whole bunch of preconceived ideas. Is that often a good thing or a bad thing? So a lot of your job is sort of getting rid of old habits first before you start down the right pathway. I think what I've seen over, you know, 12 plus years of helping initially family and friends and then, you know, all of our clients feel is that, there are more motivated people coming to us, like that inherent motivation to improve their financial situation and understanding that the pension's not going to cut it or that they want better than that. Absolutely, that's increased. But I think what has also increased is the confusion around what they should do because of this saturation of different messages. Is now the right time to buy? You know, should I buy where I live? Where should I buy? I don't know where to start. My mate said this, you know, whatever it might be. And clearly, you know, as we say, we're not buying lollipops here. So whenever there's an element of doubt in what they should be doing, that tends to lead to inaction. So we find, you know, people are approaching us to kind of get that guidance. And I always say at all of the the events that we present, you know, my goal is to simplify the world of investment because when you distill it down into the most basic concepts, which are not taught at school in Australia. They're not well understood throughout the general population. And they're definitely not taught to us by our parents because what they were taught is something that's almost the polar opposite of what we need to be doing today. You know, while they're fairly basic concepts, they're just not well understood. So pretty quickly, as we start to guide our clients through some of these core investment fundamentals, how they can do it, how they can mitigate risk and and what our process is, the light bulb goes on and they realize, hey, maybe I can do this too. And then the natural motivation takes over and and that's how the relationship tends to kick off. That's why I think, you know, to uh, Cam's point earlier, since we started, half of our business give or take each year has been repeat and referral. So as we start to take our clients on that journey and they learn the basics and they realize that, hey, I can do this too and they're empowered, they start spreading the word, which is just great. Yeah, and, and that's absolutely critical. And, and I think, you know, a big part of what I do here at Smart Property Investment is try and demystify property investment. Property investment isn't hard. You know, right. if you follow a strategy, it's pretty much anyone can do it. And I think what happens is that a lot of people get confused whether they're listening to the wrong people or speaking to the wrong people that there's some magic thing that only one person has and you don't know it. And the best investors I know bring everything back to the basics. And Cam, I think you guys are really focusing on this at the moment, really dissecting what makes investors successful and how you can apply some of those capabilities and thoughts and, and experience from other people in your day-to-day property investment journey. You've got something coming up soon, don't you, in relation to this? Uh, yeah, we do, mate. If uh, For those listeners who are listening to this pretty well after release on the 27th of August at 12, 30 and 7, we're, we're running a, a webinar which uh, Michael and I will host and it's basically golden rules of master investors. We've dissected four key investors and we're looking at the traits, that they, the investment strategies and the traits that they hold and the core lessons that we took from them along our investment journey that helped us form the way we invest. So we've got Warren Buffett, as, uh, as what Michael calls him, Warren Buffett, the French guy, but arguably one of the world's greatest investors. We've got uh, Tony Robbins, who a lot of people, while they see him as a take action sort of guy, he's actually a, quite a smart investor and entrepreneur. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki, who's one of the uh, one of the all time favorite books of many investors, and uh, we've done a hat, hat tip to Jan Summers, who was actually the first person that gave me my light bulb moment back in early or late eighties, I suppose. I saw a VHS video of Jan with big shoulder pads and uh, the, the basics about you know compound growth, duplication, land appreciating, buildings depreciating, and that she set me and I was I think I was fourteen or fifteen at the time when I saw that VHS. But that set me on the path to property investing. So we've delved into Jan's background a little bit and some of her successes as a bit of a hat tip. And a thank you for her. 
Yeah, I know a lot of people look to Jan as, you know, the matriarch, probably invest okay, in Australia. Yeah. She's been, um, what she was doing 20 years ago is still consistent today. So this goes back to finding a strategy that works for you that has a specific outcome and going about doing it. Can you give us a bit of an inside finding from uh, your webinars tomorrow? What, what would be one thing that's common amongst all those four investors that have made them successful? To be, to be brutally honest, and, and it's actually one of Jan's sayings, which rings true with each of them, don't be a lemming. So the majority of Australians go about doing the same old, same thing and get the same result as the majority of Australians, which is retiring financially below the poverty line or at the poverty line. So they'll, they'll chew into their super and then end up on what's close to the pension if they've got anything left. So the main thing about those individuals and most successful investors I know is that they're happy to strategically do something outside of the norm. So um, I think that's the main thing. Right? Um, and that's one of the quick core lessons we'll go through. We've got some good bits and pieces there. You can jump onto opencorp.com.au and register for that. And if it's past the event, you can do a contact us and we'll get you a, uh, it's a gated webinar. So we'll have a recording of it we can get for people. Okay, that sounds really good. And, you know, going back to what successful investors doing, and accessibility to investment, and it's something that Jan Summers has talked about, is if you've got a job in Australia and you have a strategy and you've got the right people around you, Cam, can you invest in property? Is it available and accessible to everyone? Yeah, it's, it's funny, you know, so February was probably, if we talk about volume of investments that we provide to clients, February was the, the highest volume we'd had in two and a half years thereabouts, forgive me if I'm wrong, Michael. June was the second highest. So you think about it. So this is through the COVID period. February, great guns, everyone locked down. We sat there working out what government policy leaders will be put in place. Once initial lockdowns came back, the property market across Australia took off. And June, we had the largest amount of investors bar February for a couple of years investing with us because we get some really good buying at the moment. You well, interest rates are low as they've ever been, right? It's never been amazing. more accessible. It's amazing. Even just looking at interest rates, I mean, you talk about, I think, obviously, the cost of borrowing has dropped 30 to 40% for some borrowers. Theoretically, somebody who's earning the same today as they're earning at the start of the year can borrow 40% more than they could at the start of the year. So that's going to flow through to property prices. And, and again, it's the, one of those cause and effect things you have to think about. One thing we broke down in investing for the new normal, and people would shoot me an email, Cam at OpenCorp, if they want to get a pre-release copy of that. But we broke down, and I look at the share market and we analysed this, the, uh, was it the S&P Top 500, if you look at the last 20 years, it's averaged, if you buy and hold long term, and that's what we uh, instill in people, in the share market, which is a lot more liquid and moves around a bit more during these economic times, which is why we did the study into it, and you would average about an 8.2% growth rate. If you excluded the top 10 growth days out of that 20 years, you're down to 4.5%, the top 20, you're down to 2.1%, and the top 30 days, you're down to zero for that. So a lot of people go through these economic times and get out of whatever market they're in. One thing that was really interesting, which uh, JP Morgan did a study and we got the data from it, was... The best six days out of the, um, those 20 years were within two weeks of the worst days. So if we look at where the growth happens is straight after it. Now, we said the share market is a lot more volatile, but what we've also done in the study through the book that we've put together is the 12 to 24 months after an economic downturn is when we've seen huge amounts of growth in the property market, residential, medium density property market in Australia. Other types of markets move around a bit, but for those who want to buy and take advantage of the upswing when when it happens, there's good to be had for sure. So, mate, you run through it really quickly there. So, you making that available to people if they want a, a pre-release copy of it? Yeah, we're looking at uh, it'll be in market within the next three to four weeks. It'll go to print, so uh, publishers will probably get it out within the next month. But if people want a pre-release copy of it, they're welcome to email me and I'll put them in a list to make sure they get a copy of it. So, yeah, like I said Cam at Open Corp, but it's a a collaboration piece that Matt, Michael and I have been working on over the last 15 years and the core of it. So it's basically the white paper that Steve handed to us in a binder way back when, mm. that we put it together and thought during this period of time, we'll piece it together and actually make it into a book. Well, was it equal contribution? Let's be honest. Who did most of the heavy lifting on it, boys? We've, we've bounced around a bit. Over the years, the last 15 years, probably Matt and I, but what, where we've pieced it together, and I'm a lazy Phil, like when I <laughs> books, I'm really lazy, so I'll dictaphone stuff or rev it and get it transcribed and then shape it into play. And then I hand it to Matt and say, can you fix it up and put all your red pen across it and uh, fix up all my mistakes? And then we bounce it back to Boz and say, is that about right? So it's a collaborative effort. But uh, this one, Matt and I probably done the heavy lifting. 
Yeah, no, but it sounds like that's a a good creative journey to actually extract the information and three people coming from very different areas. And Matthew, no doubt, I know a lot of our listeners have been going, this is all really good. I only get in touch with Cam, get a copy of the book. But what they really want to know is where they should be investing right now. Any any sort of any filter for people to approach investing in this current market? Any locations that you guys like more than others at the moment that you're happy to to give away? Look, I'm, I guess I'm always reluctant to give a specific forecast, especially um, I guess to people who perhaps might hear a soundbite but not do the rest of the homework that they have to do. Uh, but we absolutely look at, as I mentioned earlier, vacancy rates. There's some areas of Australia that are seeing a downward trending vacancy rate. We know, obviously, in March, there was a huge spike and there was talk of, I guess, defaults on rentals all around the country as, I guess, the media started to try and, I guess, make some headlines. And certainly, there was a lot of uh, Airbnbs and short-term rentals that came into the permanent rental pool. Uh, so, there was a big spike. Now, most of that's gone out and there's other than two markets around Australia at the moment and it doesn't take much time to do the homework on this. But most of the capital cities are actually trending down right now. And I'm, I mean, Brisbane, I think, as one where the vacancy rate a few years ago was over 4.5%. And that's been trending down strongly. It's lower today than it was at the start of the year, despite COVID. Perth's another market going that direction, certainly parts of Melbourne as well, where there's a lot lower vacancy rate. Now, Melbourne's such a big city that it's not homogenous. You can't say that the vacancy rate is consistent across the board. Obviously, centrally, there's a much higher vacancy rate, and that can skew the numbers. But there's pockets of Melbourne. Our property management team had 25 people bidding for a property they weren't able to walk through just a week ago in Melbourne. So again, we tend to find that where there's low vacancy rates and there's pressure on tightening vacancy, as we saw in Hobart two years ago, and that's the pressure's come off a little bit there. But you see when there's tight vacancies, it tends to lead to higher capital growth as well as rental growth. And that's what we all want as investors, isn't it? We want our income to be improving and the value to go up. Come on, Louie, don't hold your cards close to your chest. I'll ask you a question. Give him a suburb. Where was this hero property? 25 people standing out the front. Where was it? It was out in Berwick Waters, wasn't it, Ken? There you go. There, there you go. go. So, there you go, Phil. We've given you a suburb. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think, I think the important point that Matthew made is that, you know, a property is an individual thing. It's got to fit in your portfolio at a particular sure. point in time yeah. and depending on yeah, your sure. circumstances. So, but, but you've got to look for the clues. Look, look for the drivers and the mechanics that are going to help you understand where that should be. And, you know, to pick up the narrative from Cam beforehand, that the biggest upside swings in people creating wealth through share markets has been during a period of time close to major fluctuations to the market. And, you know, a question for you, Michael, um, that no doubt a lot of investors will be thinking about. On that basis, if this is going to be the time when if you are in the market making the right decisions, you can potentially make the greatest longer-term capital growth, should you be rushing into the market right now? Or how long or how wide is this window going to be to be an effective investor to potentially capitalise on this particular dynamic? Yeah, again, that's a bit of a crystal ball question, Phil, but the way that I'll answer it, I'll, I'll ask you a question back. With the benefit of hindsight, would you have bought a property 35 years ago? Absolutely. I'm yet to meet someone that wouldn't. But if I'd said to you 35 years ago, hey, Phil, you can buy a property, but in the next 35 years, negative gearing will be taken away. Then it will come back. Then we'll have a recession, double-digit inflation. We'll have an Asian financial crisis where international stock markets lost 60% of their value. A couple of years after that, we'll have September 11. Six years after that, seven years after that, we'll have the GFC and then we'll have a tough lending environment the number of people that would be willing to buy 35 years ago drops dramatically. But we all know what's happened over that time. So I was listening as Matt and Cam were talking before and thinking that I guess when you get well-practiced and well-versed at shutting out short-term situations like COVID, I bring it back to what I call the pub test. So if we're sitting at the pub having a beer when we could and I said to you that there was a way that you could invest in something that had a proven track record, that in addition to the proven track record, the government is going to be forced to adopt certain policies that will benefit house prices coming out of the COVID downturn. Interest rates are going to be low and at record lows for the foreseeable future based on some indicators that we can look at to understand that. And it's the bank's vested interest to ensure that the property market is stable. Is property something that you'd invest in? That's really what it comes down to is the nuts and bolts. It doesn't matter what the COVID count is yesterday versus what it might be tomorrow. That's what we talk about coming back to that long-term stuff. So I'm a bird in the hands worth two in the bush. I'd much rather be in. How good does it have to be? 
know that the um, the, the vested interests mean that the, the market will be stable, and we've definitely seen that in terms of the floor being protected in the last six months or thereabouts, and know that that recovery will come. So if I can hold a property that's paying for itself from day one, the growth will happen when it will happen, and there's definitely that long-term outlook. That's what we're talking to our clients more about. And probably just a couple of other things, and I, I don't think that it's it's ever necessary to try and tell people that if they don't invest now, they're going to miss out forever because that's absolutely not the case. But I guess when you look at what's happened even to date and you think think about timing and urgency, I guess, to some degree, four months ago, the, every developer in Perth was giving away fifteen to $20,000 to a buyer who came along, whether it was an owner-occupier investor. They were desperate to sell. They couldn't almost couldn't give their land away. Obviously, then the federal government announced the home builder scheme where they're giving $25,000 to eligible owner occupiers. And a day later, the state government offered an additional $20,000 to investors and owner occupiers. Within a week, every developer in Perth had sold every title block of land that they had. They'd gotten rid of every one of their discounts and they were selling land at full price again. And then a month later, their prices have gone up. So within the space of about a month, the price has gone up by about 10% on a lot of blocks of land instantaneously. Now, that hasn't flowed through to house prices, but that creates a lot of activity. We see similar in Brisbane. The number of land sales went up 400% in June. So once the market comes out of lockdown, and they call it the elastic band effect, there's months and months of people not buying who need to buy because they've got to move out of their property at some point in the future or they're outgrowing it. And all of a sudden, they come into the market at the same time. So there's a lot of demand all of a sudden focused on a very short space of time. Therefore, obviously, that has a bit of caused a bit of a bounce. So we've seen that, as I said, in Perth and Queensland. We've seen it around the world in some of the other major cities where the cities come out of a lockdown. We haven't yet seen it in Sydney because Sydney's still bubbling away a little bit with the health and Melbourne's, Melbourne's a bit of a leper colony right now. And there's a lot of constraints on people turning up at auctions and and so on. So we expect that there's going to be a bit of an elastic band as well, plus mm. the benefit of any other stimulus that the government puts in after we get through this. And right now the handbrake's on because half the country's in lockdown. Once that comes out, the government's really going to start pumping some gas to build up this economy and you know where it ends up. Yeah. And it sort of lends itself to Michael's point. You can sit around and be an armchair investor and and sit on the sidelines and comment and pontificate. Or if you're not in the market, you're not going to get the benefits of the market, good or bad. So um, everyone needs to have their own attitude towards that. And those attitudes are going to be shaped by your mindset, mindset shaped by education. So two things that to help you on that journey, um, and myself included, I'm always trying to stress this and challenge myself, the, the pre-release of this book called, Cam, what is it again? Investing in the new normal. Okay. So this being the new normal, I guess, uh, cam at opencorp.com.au. But learning from other investors is key, hence the reason why we do the Smart Property Investment Show. But are those four investors, these guys are going to break down tomorrow. So that's on Thursday, the 27th. Thursday, the 27th. Cam, that's at opencorp.com.au. You can register there. Is that right? You can register there. And if it's past that date, mate, they can do a contact us and we can shoot a link so they can watch it post the uh, event. Too easy. Gents, uh, I've really enjoyed the chat. Let's do this again soon. I think uh, you've got four people that know a little bit about property here, so I think we've been able to balance that pretty well. So I appreciate your your insights and uh, and your efforts in this COVID lockdown environment. Uh, all good fun, mate. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, Phil. Nice one. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank good you, guys. Thanks, buddy. Remember to check out smartpropertyinvestment.com.au if you're not yet subscribing to our daily morning newsletter so you're the first to know what's going on in property right across the nation, smartpropertyinvestment.com.au forward slash subscribe, our social media, Smart Property HQ. You can find us there. We'll see you again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.